have a great friend of mine, two great friends of mine, uh, Marisa Meyer, who's been uh, coming for, to the web for four years and uh, who leads uh, local and maps at Google, with uh, MG Siegler, of a partner at uh, the Crunch Fund, if you want to join me on stage. Hello, Marisa. Hi. Welcome again. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Louis. Hey, MG. Yeah, I never know where to sit. Um, <laughs> you take there. So we're joking. Obviously, I'm not Mike Arrington, and he's usually <laughs> the one who's up here with you, interviewing you. Um, I'll try not to annoy you as much as, uh, <laughs> as it looks like he does. It looks like you guys always have fun on stage. We but, do. Um, but, you know, he, he likes to uh, prod at you a bit. So I'm not sure I'll do that. I'll do my best not to do that, but I might. I can't promise anything. Um, you know, one thing uh, that's, that's interesting, you know, kind of watching your career, it's you've had a bunch of different titles at Google. I mean, how much does... How much do the titles matter? Like, you know, we were just talking, like, what, what title should, uh, should Luik introduce you with? Like, are you kind of like Robert De Niro in uh, Casino, where you can switch titles a lot, and it really doesn't matter? You're just kind of a person behind the scenes, really deeply involved in everything? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, I don't think the titles do matter very much. I think what matters is what you work on and what your focus is. And so for me right now, my focus is local and maps. Uh, so it's everything from Google Maps to Google Maps for mobile, to things like latitude, street view, local search, you know, all things that have to do with location. And so, right. but uh, you know, over time I've been involved in all kinds of different things, you know, everything from search to iGoogle, uh, to images, books, news, Chrome, toolbar, all kinds of different things along the way. How long have you been doing the location stuff now? Uh, for just over a year. I moved over to focus on local and maps last year in October. Okay. And um, so, you know, diving into that a bit, uh, there was some news the other day that, that kind of leaked out, it looked like, and, and Google just confirmed it about kind of the Google Plus check-in deals are, are maybe, maybe coming their way. I was wondering how that, um, how that kind of ties into the other stuff you've been doing, like with Latitude and, of course, Places. How do you kind of uh, unify all these different products, since they're all sort of dancing around the same thing, which is not only check-ins, but also deals and, and things of that nature. How do, you, how do you view that? Well, we view that check-ins are just something that are really useful for our users. It's a good way to help find your friends. Latitude, you, know, you can use check-ins there, or you can just have always-on location sharing. Uh, and so it's really something that's of a lot of use to our end users. And we think there are interesting ways that could help us monetize, but also help end users save money. And that's really what uh, some of the daily deals and some of the check-in offers uh, are about. And so what we had done is we'd accidentally published an early uh, an end user in one of our user forums, a right, user right, article. Right. So we've taken that back down, and we're targeting a launch next week of this feature uh, with merchants. Gotcha. But you know, in terms of the different products, with, with Google Plus and Latitude, obviously there's a huge emphasis right now within Google for Google Plus, pushing that way. Do these other products still get priority in any way? Like, are you guys still working actively on Latitude? Is that still something that you're, that's going to be going forward, a product? Uh, we are actively working on Latitude. We have uh, more than 10 million users who are sharing their location through Latitude. So it's a huge service, uh, and it's really quite popular. It works for uh, you know, actually sharing your location in terms of being able to also find, find your phone. It's another great utility for that. And so you know, we are... Um, we're continuing to try and roll out new features. We have some new things coming out. We just launched uh, Google Maps for mobile uh, 6.0 on the recent version uh, of Android. And we are going to be bringing out even more improvements in the near future there. I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk this week. One of the big stories was um, face, Facebook buying Gowalla, which is, of course, one of the, the players, longtime players in the location space. Um, overall, how do you think that, that's, that the space itself is looking? You know, there's, there's other players like Simple Geo who is kind of doing platform um, stuff in the location space. It seems a bit like things have cooled down after an intense hot period around the location space itself. How, is, that the, is that fair to say? Is that how you view it? 
Um, I don't think so, actually. I think that there's a lot of activity in local. I think that people can see that there's a lot of potential in terms of, especially with the phone, pe people being able to see, this is where I am, here's where I am in the world, what's available out on the web to help me, and there's a lot of people playing in that space. That said, because there's so much activity, I think there, it is natural for there to be some long-term winners, some, some losers. I do think that we're starting to see that. And there's a lot of people who are starting to bet on, well, what makes for a successful local company? Is it whether or not you transact? Right? So the, you know, some of the companies that are more transactional tend to have more revenue. Is it whether or not you own the data? Because if you own the data, you can do a lot of innovation. That's mm -hmm. something that we've put a big focus on, uh, on for example, on Google Maps actually building our own maps of different countries around the world. We think that actually helps us in terms of being able to really innovate, personalize those maps, understand how to help our users better. So there's a lot of different things happening here. But that said, it, it is clear that location is really useful. One of the things we've seen, particularly on the phone, is just a huge uh, growth in usage. So you know, right behind voice calls and text, Maps is about the most used thing on the phone. And we experienced crossover, which is how, what I would refer to as um, when our mobile usage surpassed our desktop usage permanently mm -hmm. in June. So we saw it for the first time last Christmas that on Christmas Day and on New Year's Day, we had more mobile usage for Maps than desktop. And then towards the end of is spring... Is that just on Android, or is that across all? That's across everything. Okay. So, and then at the end of spring, we started seeing crossover on the weekends, because obviously people tend to use their phone more when they're traveling on the holidays or when they're away from work on the weekends, and then we permanently crossed over in June. So from here to forth, we will always have more traffic and usage on the phone than we will on desktop. And so it's clear that location and, and maps are a very core part of the mobile experience, and because mobile is growing so quickly, I think that location is here to stay. That said, because there was so much activity, I don't think it's that surprising it's to start to see some people pulling down. away and, and, and some falling away. And you know, one of the things I think uh, Eric Schmidt showed off on stage yesterday, and, and you, were, you alluded mm -hmm. to with a new thing, was the indoor maps. Why focus on that? Like, how do you even do that? How do you get, do you have sure. to go into a mall? It, Ikea is right, one of them. You yeah. Can, you can, I, you get lost in Ikea, now you can get them out <laughs> well, map. They have a lot of maps. Probably if you've gone, ever gone through an Ikea, there's lots of maps on the walls and right. like lots of help to try and get people to navigate through all the shortcuts. They all seem the to leave to the bathroom every, every time I turn all around. All these shortcuts all over. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, we, we think that indoor spaces are equally important. And for example, in a really big venue space like this or in a big store, it can be as confusing inside the space as it is outside. So really to help our users understand those spaces, find things like shops and shopping malls, or stores or restrooms in an airport, we've gotten really focused on indoor maps. So we launched uh, last week uh, on Tuesday uh, in our Google Maps for Mobile 6.0. Uh, what we refer to as GMM 6.0. We have indoor maps, uh, and we have airports all across the, the US. We have all the transit stations in Tokyo. We've also partnered with a lot of large space retailers, like Best Buy and Ikea's, to understand it. But not only do we have the indoor maps, we're actually able to place you inside of those spaces, which I find particularly helpful, because we want people to be able to navigate inside. So you're used to the little blue dot telling you where you are on Google Maps. Now the little blue dot tells you where you are on the maps inside. And that's all done using Wi-Fi, basically, Wi-Fi signals. So because so. you can't use GPS indoors, you won't be able to get a good enough signal. And you don't use street view cars going around inside the buildings? You actually, no. Okay. <laughs> we do. What we do is we use this. We, uh, for most of these, what we're doing is using a survey tool. So basically, someone comes through and takes a, uh, takes a survey measurement every few feet to understand how the Wi-Fi signals behave inside the space. And then later, based on those measurements, we can identify roughly where people are. I want to hop back for a second. You were talking about some of the standalone companies. Obviously, Groupon just IPO'd um, recently, and there was a lot of talk about Google and Groupon back in the day. What are your thoughts on their business now? Are they going to be able to, to make it? Obviously, they have made it already. They're, they're a public company. But do you see that as a long-term standalone business? Because obviously, you guys are doing some of the same things that they're in the business of doing now. Is that something that can, can survive on itself, or does it need to be a part of a broader strategy? 
Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to comment on another company, but I do think that the the deal space is something that's really compelling and it's really compelling because it helps end users. Uh, and so it's some place where we're very focused. I do think that we'll see things change a lot uh, in the coming years. It's a very early space. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that a lot of what can really provide value to end users, personalization, integration into everyday tasks. So you basically find deals that are really well suited for you as part of what you would do anyway. Uh, I think is something that's, that's really key. And that's some place where you can expect us to focus. Switching gears a bit to, um, to Google Plus. Obviously, this is a, a huge initiative within Google that's spreading out throughout the entire company itself. How does that play into what you're doing beyond just what we were talking about, uh, of course, with the, you know, the forthcoming check-in deals? Um, has it really, has it supercharged the, the company itself? Like, does your division get really excited about Google Plus? Sure. So we've been really pleasantly surprised uh, with Google Plus. We've had 40 million users sign up in just three months. And this is really critical for local, because local feeds social and social feeds local. When we look for places near us or look for places to go, chances are you're not going by yourself. You're meeting someone there. You're going there with someone. And so particularly when we look at things like Google Places or local search, it really is about a social activity and that type of social context. And so understanding the connections between people and really helping people understand you know, where have their friends been, where do their friends like, where should they go together, all of those things are things that really help local. And so we're very excited about the social efforts in Google Plus and what it means in terms of what we can offer our users. I mean, you're obviously, you've been at Google a long time now, and you've seen all these different things. Why do you think that Google Plus is working where the other social inroads haven't worked so far? What do you th is there something different that you guys are doing? Well, one of the things is that this is not our first attempt. And we've learned a lot from the first few attempts. Uh, we launched Wave, uh, and we also launched Buzz. And we learned a lot of lessons from those. With Wave, we really learned that, well, it was a great concept. It really was hard for people to understand how to use it. And so making sure that it was easy to use, also making sure that we didn't overpromise on the launch was something that we, we learned uh, from the Wave launch. And with Buzz, we really learned a lot about privacy and how to communicate with our users around privacy. And privacy has been built into Google Plus from the beginning. And we also started Google Plus as the Google Plus project and did a small field test to really understand how it would work. And so some of the, the ways that we launched Google Plus and, and, have, and have developed it have been based on lessons we've learned from prior attempts. And I think that's one of the reasons why Google Plus has gotten more traction. And it's also a lot of emphasis has been placed on design, right? And that's, that's kind of a, a, a new area of emphasis for Google, less about data, more about design. I, I assume you have some interesting thoughts there. Like, why, why do you think? Do you think that everything looks good now? Is, uh, is, is Google Plus where it needs to be in terms of, of design quality? And, and uh, is Google itself in a, in a good place now? Because for a while, like, design was, was secondary, right? Because it was all about speed and the, the importance of not having anything on the Google homepage besides just the Google logo, logo in the box and a very Spartan design. Like, how, how do you view that now? What, what you're doing. Well, I mean, I think the design has always been really important to us because it, design is what ends up supporting what a user wants to do. And so I think speed is still really key. But by organizing the interface more and by providing a little bit more focus on the design itself, we think we can help users be even more efficient, understand where to look, how, how to interact with the interface, where are the settings, how do I switch to a different product. All of those things are the things that we're looking for because we recognize that these are common user actions, and they maybe haven't been findable enough in the past. And so we want to make sure that we have a good, consistent design that's fast and fluid and beautiful across all of our products. And that's really where the focus on design is now. Uh, talking a bit about Android, obviously, huge product uh, for you guys now. How important is it to, to what you're doing specifically? You know, you have to think about things from the location side of things in mobile uh, from all sides, right? I mean, cross-platform. But how much of the time is spent on Android specifically? And you know, now you have the new uh, the, Ga the Galaxy Nexus is out there, a brand new flagship phone. Uh, how much is your team working on that stuff, uh, just focusing on Android specifically? 
Sure. Well, Google Maps has to work on all kinds of different platforms. And so we develop applications and APIs to work on all of the different, the different platforms. That said, Android is something special for us because we can do so much more in terms of features. Uh, so for example, last year at the web, we had launched vectors uh, in maps, which basically meant that our maps became 1 1,000th the size. Because instead of downloading tiles, we were downloading a vector scheme that could be rendered. Uh, and because the maps were so much smaller, they're a lot faster. But they also allowed us to do all kinds of things like introducing 3D buildings. Because the maps were so much smaller, we could just go ahead and offer 3D buildings. And that's something now that's part of Google Maps for mobile as part of the base assumption for end users. You can see the buildings in 3D. We also could do things like cache maps around places where you are right now and places where you are frequently. So even if your signal drops, you still are able to see the map around you. And those are all things and innovations that we've been able to build inside of Android because we're working really closely with the operating system and because we have more freedom and flexibility there. And so we really do like Android as a platform. And Google Maps for mobile uh, by far shines the most on Android because we can do so much more with features. Similarly, indoor maps, Android is the platform that we're able to launch that on. Is the idea, though, to, to kind of do it on Android first and, and hopefully matriculate it out to other platforms, kind of, kind of push lead by example? Is that kind of the idea with all the projects you're working on? Well, it certainly is the case that we love to showcase these new technologies and things that we can do on Google Maps for mobile. And the platform that we have the most flexibility with is Android. And so that, you know, if you look at Google Maps for mobile, it's far ahead on Android. Uh, we're, we'll open it up for a, a few questions from the audience if, uh, if someone with a microphone is, is able to get around. So someone could just raise their hand, and uh, someone with a microphone will hopefully uh, uh, come over to you. Well, uh, I'll wait for those for a few minutes. But um, I wanted to ask you, what is your and what is Google's bigger fear, becoming Microsoft or becoming Yahoo? <laughs> and you have to answer one of them. I don't want to I hear, have like, to answer one of them. Yes. Um, wow. Uh, I mean, I think that. I mean, obviously, I think that every company is its is is its own thing, um, and I think that. That's not one of them. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to pick either one. <laughs> uh, I think that, you know, for us, we really want to be really re really relevant to end users, and we really want to be participating in innovation and technology. Uh, and I think that we have really have, have striven hard to do that. And that's one of the reasons why we've explored lots of new and interesting things over the years, like Chrome and Android and YouTube. And if you look at some of these new brands and avenues that we've, we've brought out over the years, it really has been about really staying relevant with the, with, with the users. And I, and I think that you know, Microsoft and Yahoo have relevance for users in different ways. Um, but I think that for us, the big focus is on relevance. And if either of those outcomes would mean that we would be less relevant, less useful for our users, that would be a bad outcome. All right, fair enough. Um, were there questions out there? Is anyone at, at a microphone? I'm not even sure if there is this microphone. I see, I see a hand up over here. But Hello. Oh, sorry. Hey, MJ. Hey, hey Chris. Chris. Hey, we've had some great insights this morning. Um, I was wondering if you could share perhaps some of your insights on what it takes to be a great product manager and actually run great product management teams. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I think that this is certainly running a team, the biggest and most important thing is the people actually hiring them and understanding how to find people who can look at technology, look at what's possible, and translate that into a great application. And I know for me, when I do hiring, I look for, you know, a lot of times, by the time I talk to a candidate, they've gone through all the technical hurdles. And, they, and we know that they're technically very good. And so a lot of times, I'll focus on things like, what's the coolest thing you've seen in the past six months? because I want to see what kinds of things capture their imagination. Uh, and you also want people who are excited about things, right? You don't want someone who's just too cool for school and they're like, oh, I haven't seen anything good lately. Or you want someone who's like, oh my gosh, I saw something great last week. Um, or you know, I'll ask people, what's their favorite thing that they own? And it should be a physical thing that just delights you. 
because I think our job as product managers is to create products that delight people. And if you can understand what delights you and what brings out that emotion, the chances are you can replicate it. Uh, and in terms of good product management, once you're, you know, once you're inside the company and designing a product, a lot of it is you, know, you want to understand the technology because you know, the mechanics of building the product, understanding what's possible, what's hard, what's easy, you know, that you need to know and you need to know cold. And so I do think that like, the technical aspects of product management are, are, really, are really important. And for, for almost all of Google's product managers, we focus on bringing in computer scientists for that reason. So I think the technology piece of it is important, but that's sort of a given for us. Um, and I do think that listening is something that's really important, because as the product manager, it's not your job to have all the answers. It is your job to make sure that you're listening to everyone on the team, understanding the end user concerns, understanding the ideas from your engineers, and really bringing together uh, a vision that is coherent and, and sensible. If we've got another question out there, someone can uh, run up to the microphone. Um, while we're waiting for that, uh, another, another um, not too many curveballs. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep throwing yes. at you. Uh, w one question for Marissa, please. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, are you in a good way in connecting Gmail plus uh, Google plus Google plus plus uh, YouTube? I mean, I have a friend who was visiting an adult site. And the day after, he went online with his daughter, and he has some X advertising on a screen. And he said, well, Google, Google is going the wrong way connecti connecting all these accounts. Uh, well, so as we've talked about, we launched Google Plus this summer. And now you know, Larry has made the point that now we're launching the Google part of really taking Plus and taking the connections that have been formed there and making all of our products more social. That said, I'm pretty sure that what your friend saw was probably just a coincidence uh, because I don't believe that we've, we've launched or announced anything, anything that quite like that. However, we do think that it's important to have one account across all of our services because we think it's important for end users to understand what information we have about them and really feel the power from one of those services across all the services in terms of personalization. Um, I'm sure you're not going to comment on the stories about the Google, Plus, the Google X uh, project stuff. But one of the things you know, supposedly run out of there is the, uh, the self-driving car thing or that was spun out of there. What are your general thoughts on that, like Google doing these crazy, you know, futuristic type things. Obviously, a lot of people view it as, as a really exciting thing, things like of that nature that Google's working on. Others view it as kind of distracting things that Google's kind of throwing money at. How do you uh, uh, view it in your, in your own head? Well, I think that you know, I've always been of the view that it's important to explore some of these far-flung ideas. And I've also been at Google long enough now that I've seen that some of those far-flung ideas do become core. Right? One of our early strategies was what we called 70-20-10. Put 70% of the people on search and ads, put 20% of the people on related areas to, to, to search and ads, and put 10% of people on very far-flung ideas. And interestingly, some of the things that started off in those 10% uh, were things like Orkut, our social network, uh, and things like Chrome, because we weren't really sure how those would fit into our strategy. And yes, we've also had some other things like you know, Google Ride Finder, <laughs> which I guess is sort of an early, very, very, very distant cousin of something like Uber, <laughs> right? But, like, but you know, it's like, you know, so we've had those kinds of far-flung projects. Some of them haven't gone anywhere, like you know, Google Ride Finder. Some of them have actually migrated to be very core to us, like Chrome, or very core to how people use technology, like social. And so I think it's important to be exploring around the fringes, because some of those items along the fringe become something that's really central. And so I think that the driverless cars is something that fits right into what we're good at. When you're driving a car, there's literally several hundred signals coming in. How far away from, you are the car, from the car in front of you are you? What's happening with traffic? Where are you trying to navigate to? All the different sensor information. And finding just the right signal and understanding what's important and understanding how to make decisions isn't all that different from search. And so you know, we're really taking some of our core competencies and applying it to one of these far-flung problems. And I do think things like traffic, safety, 
you know, ultimately the fuel utility, things like that are something that can be helped a lot with better use of cars. One of the things we see is we have something called route around traffic that is inside Google Maps for mobile and, and our navigation application. So when you're navigating, you can say, hey, I don't want to get stuck in traffic, route me around it. And our estimate is that every day we save two years of idle time in cars. And when you think about like, how much time that is, right? So for every user, it's just a little bit of time. But when that adds up, it's two years of extra, more productive time for people who aren't sitting in cars. And it's two years less of cars idling and running through gasoline. And so you know, some of these things can be really significant for the world. And so I think if we can take some of our core competencies and apply it um, to some of these far-flung problems, they may ultimately become core in a way that's very significant. Do you even worry about, you know, at, at such an exploratory stage, do you even worry about monetizing those things at all? Like, obviously, you know, people saving two hours a day or whatever, you know, if, if they're able not to drive themselves. Is the idea there that they'll be able to do more Google searches and ultimately lead <laughs> to that? Or, or, or how do you think of that? You know, no, there, I mean, I just, we, we are just responding to user demand, right? Like, people use Google Maps. One of the reasons they use Google Maps is to figure out how to get somewhere, and they want to get somewhere on time. If you're stuck in traffic, you're not going to get there on time. And so it's really a, a user driven feature and it's not about monetizing it's really in that case about helping people get somewhere more efficiently we think that if google maps is a great application gets you places on time chances are you'll use it more we might have more opportunities in the future to monetize you but it's not going to be about monetizing your, that particular routing around traffic it'll be over the longer term relationship that you have with google maps and local search all right. Well, thanks a lot, Marissa, for taking the time. Really good Thank stuff. Thank you very much.